Um, I want to tell you about our first speaker today. Matt Sharp is with the Alliance Defending Freedom, and he is wonderful. We are so happy that he's here. Um, Alliance Defending Freedom does great work, especially in the realm of religious liberty. I'm going to talk to you about something different than the religious side today. But I just want to share a quick story of how they came to our aid. We helped write the transgender bill that banned all of those awful procedures, as you know. Well, when, yes, gay. <laughs> well, one of the authors of the bill is in the room right now, sitting at the back. Um, we're just very thankful. It was a team effort, but we really, the main drafter is here today. Margaret, we love you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Well, as soon as the bill got passed, the Europe sued the state, saying that it was illegal and it's unconstitutional. We have no part of it. We just write legislation and sponsors look at it. They make changes to it, and it goes through the legislative process. We just give them an idea, and they take it. We had no part of this lawsuit. Well, the Department of Justice decided to join in with these parents and sue the state of Alabama. And they heard that Eagle Forum was involved. So they sent a subpoena to our headquarters in Birmingham and wanted us to turn over all kinds of information that they were not allowed to have. The UNIR president said, we are not going to do this because if we give them what they want, they will go after every other nonprofit and do this. We have to take a stand. And there were some around that had heard what had happened that thought, just give her the stuff. Just don't, don't make it ways. And she said, no. We have to fight, and so again, we have a hero amongst us. Well, ADF came along, we, they provided an attorney for us to help us fight that. We, we, our judge sided with the ADF attorney representing us, and the subpoena was quashed. Then we went forward and brought sanctions against the main motion, or what we're trying to do to get sanctions for the Department of Justice. We're still waiting on that answer. But Matt is part of the team that does such amazing work. And today he's going to talk about bullying from the corporate world. We were bullied by the government and that was bad, but now we're being bullied by the corporate world. So come up and tell us what you want us to do. Well, thank you so much, Becky. And it, it really is an honor to be with you all. And talking about that Alabama bill, um, you guys are setting precedent. You know, that bill was upheld by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and we now have 23 states that have passed legislation following an Alabama's lead to protect children from the damaging effects of these gender procedure drugs and surgeries. And that started here. You guys in Arkansas were the first states to do this. You were the first state to get litigated and to get that incredible court victory. Um, and so know that you're not just making a difference for kids and families here in Alabama, but truly across the country, um, your leadership has mattered in all of that. So as Becky mentioned, I did want to uh, talk a little bit about a slightly different issue, but still very much on the idea of the threats to religious liberty and free speech that we're seeing pop up, particularly in the banking sector. So let me start off with a, a little math, a little history lesson. Any of you ever seen a map like this? Raise your hand. A, a couple of you. So this is a map actually from Atlanta where I'm based at. And these were drawn up in the late 30s and 40s. Uh, and they were called uh, these sort of loan risk assessment maps. And what was happening is the, these banks and loan companies were drawing these maps to say, before we issue a loan to somebody that's looking to buy a house, we need to see how risky they are. And so I started preparing these maps, and I'll give a little zoom in. This is actually another one from uh, Philadelphia. Oops. And you can see how detailed these are. I mean, one street to the next. And then they've got these, these gradings of, you know, first grade, hey, that's a good, safe loan, uh, all the way down to fourth grade, the, the, the red lined ones, the red shaded ones. Those were risky loans. Now, what might you think was the determining factor of whether a particular neighborhood or particular street was risky or not. Race, that's exactly right. These banks and loan companies were looking at one thing. What is the color of your skin to determine whether they thought you were risky or not? And so in this truck, did these maps that say, oh no, we're not doing it based on your race, we're doing it based on where you live. But we all know that that was a cover and a front 
for these banks to go after and deny people loans so that their families could buy a house simply because the color of their skin. Now, in response to this, we saw legislation, legislation like the Fair Housing Act and others that said, you cannot engage in these invidious discriminatory practices. Someone, the color of their skin should never be a basis of whether they get a loan so that they can buy a home for their family to give them a shelter over their head. Now, thankfully, we are seeing much of that in our past. We've seen whether it's your race, whether it's your nationality, whether it's these other characteristics that are irrelevant to your ability to access things like loans, things like credit cards, things like a bank account. But what we're now seeing is a modern day version of this that is popping up across the country. And it looks very similar in some ways. Rather than geographic maps though, rather than the color of your skin, they're looking at what comes out of your mouth, your speech. They're looking at how you worship, how you live your life. They're looking at your religious beliefs. They're looking at things like are you connected to the oil or gas sector? They're looking at things like, are you connected to the firearms industry? And based upon these things, they are denying consumers, individuals across the country, good organizations and people of faith, access to a bank account, access to a loan, to credit cards, simply because of their speech, simply because of their religious beliefs. So let me give you a few examples of this to show you how this plays out. There's a great organization in Memphis, Tennessee called Indigenous Advanced Ministries. Uh, they've been a longtime uh, client of Bank of America. And to describe this organization to you, I really can't do it justice, but for years, they have been focused in the country of Uganda, uh, sending missionaries over there, sending aid work, and specifically focused on helping widows and orphans in Uganda with basic necessities, food, clothing, shelter, and things like that. They worked with churches throughout Tennessee and, and really across the country. They were likewise supporting their effort, donating to their work to help these families in Uganda. Well, one day, uh, Indigenous Advance found out that their bank account had been shut down. <laughs> this was actually just a few weeks before an upcoming mission trip to Uganda that they had been planning. They're scrambling to find out what's going on. They can't access their money. And you guys know, when your bank account is shut down, when you swipe that card and it says declined, when you try and go to the bank and withdraw something, they say, sorry, no funds. That has quick trickle-down effects, especially for a ministry. All of the aid that they had been planning to send was now frozen. They have numerous workers over in Uganda. These are individuals that are there. They live, you know, paycheck to paycheck. And for weeks, these individuals in Uganda that had been helping serve orphans and widows couldn't get paid, depriving them of the ability to eat and feed their families. As the indigenous advance started fit, trying to, to die, just asking Bank of America, why did you shut us down? Why did you shut us down? They got stonewalled again and again and again. Not only them, but one of the churches that donated to them, a church that simply donated and contributed to indigenous, indigenous advance, also found their bank account shut down. And finally, we got some national uh, media attention on this, and some reporters started calling Bank of America saying, why did you shut them down? Why did you shut them down? Again, and never given an answer to indigenous advanced. And finally, the response given was, we don't like to serve your business type. You don't meet our bank's risk tolerance. Okay. Again, this is a nonprofit serving organizations. This is a church supporting them. And again, looks very familiar to, sorry, you're just too risky for it. Going back to some of those maps, right? Let me give another example. Ambassador Sam Brownback, uh, he started an organization called the National Committee for Religious Freedom. Uh, again, they had been banking with J.P. Morgan and had some uh, great relationship there. Likewise, one day, they find out that their bank account has been shut down. No explanation given, no reason given. Not only that, once they started digging into it and, and reaching out to J.P. Morgan, saying, what's going on? Why did you shut down our account? You know, again, there's been no problems or anything. J.P. Morgan refused to provide any explanation and instead told Senator Sam Brownback's group, you must disclose your confidential donor information to us in order for us to reopen your account. Mm -hmm. So now it's not only we don't like your business type, <laughs> we don't like your business type and before we're going to do anything, we want to know everybody that's donating to you. Anybody see some concerns there? How would you feel? That's right. How would you feel if all of a sudden your support of an organization like this, an organization that's standing 
for religious freedom, an organization that's defending constitutional rights, and you're writing a, a little check to support them, why is that the bank's business? Gee, it's not. Let me give you one final one. This one, make it a little close to home. Arkansas Family Council, they're a great organization in the state of Arkansas. Uh, they do a lot of policy work, very much like Eagle for defending uh, uh, constitutional freedoms, free speech, other important values. And one day, uh, they got a call from one of their donors. And they said, hey, I went on your website and I tried to make a donation. And it declined it. It's so Arkansas Family Council reaches out. They're also with J.P. Morgan Chase saying, hey, what's going on? Again, no answer, no response, just stonewalled silence from this bank. Turns out, once again, the bank didn't like them because of their views, because of their stance. And this happened not just once, but twice to Arkansas Family Council, where they found their bank account shut down because of their religious views, because of their speech. Now, let's think about this for a second. Imagine it's you, and one day you wake up, and it's your bank account that's been shut down. It's your credit card. You know, I, I do a lot of travel. I was driving here last night and had to stop, grab a soda, fill up my cart with gas. What do I do? I grab my credit card, tap it to the things. My ability to travel here was dependent upon me having access to a bank account and a credit card. Imagine you're trying to hop on an airplane. Maybe your family's going on a vacation or you lost a loved one and you're needing to get a plane to fly to honor them. And you're unable to do so because some credit card company doesn't like that you support certain causes or that you stand for constitutional freedoms on your Facebook page. You talk about being unable to operate in this world, being shutting down a bank account, shutting down a credit card, shutting down your ability to transfer money would deny you the ability to live and work, to be able to get your paycheck deposited into your bank account, to be able to pay for your kids, uh, you know, soccer practice or whatever it may be. Uh, to get gas, to purchase an airline ticket, all of this is on the line. And this is not just limited to J.P. Morgan Chase or Bank of America. We're seeing more and more of these mega banks, these organizations begin to target and develop policies, policies that are written into their things that say, we can shut you down, we can deny you service if we disagree with your beliefs, with your values, or your support for certain causes and things like that. Now again, we go back to the 1930s and 1940s. Should race ever be a basis to turn down someone from access to a loan? Of course not. And should your constitutionally protected speech, should your constitutionally protected exercise of religion be a basis to say, sorry, you can't get a credit card, you can't have a bank account? Absolutely not. But this is the growing threat we are seeing. And the terrifying thing, these handful of banks, these handful of credit card companies dominate the market. So people may say, oh, well, you know, free market, you can always find other banks. Well, what if, like with these, 70 to 80% of all bank accounts, of all financial transactions flow through these companies? And they are, well, large power even over smaller banks. And so what happens is one of these large banks cuts them off, and then what happens, you go to the other bank and say, oh, well, if J.P. Morgan found you to be risky, we can't give you a bank account either. If MassyCard turns you away, if Visa turns you away, we at American Express cannot issue to one. You see, this has huge trickle-down effects. So while it's starting with organizations, again, we saw it happen to a church solely because of their support for indigenous advanced ministries. Mm -hmm. like, this is one of the growing threats that I think we've got to combat. It's something that we're already seeing success in. In fact, last year, Florida became the first state to say that you can't use things like this. You can't use these social credit scores Sound familiar? Something that China has been doing to say, we're going to monitor our citizens to see what you're saying, what you're doing, where you're going, to determine whether you can get access to financial institutions in China. Florida became the first state to pass such a law saying, not in Florida. We're going to protect and put our consumers first. We want a free market for our consumers so that they can bank and access these essential services. We're now seeing other states <laughs> take a huge step forward in this. We've seen places like Georgia and others introduce legislation to make sure that consumers in their states will protect. And I'm encouraged to see that I think there's some interest here in Alabama to do that. Just take a step to say, not in our state. No one should have their bank accounts shut down. No one should be denied access to these essential things because of their beliefs around us. And what does this legislation do, this prevent the banking legislation? Two simple things. Number one, it sets a clear rule. Just like a bank already can't discriminate based on race, national origin, other things, it adds to that saying, 
and you shouldn't be doing it based upon constitutionally protected speech or religious exercise. But that is off limits when it comes to charming. Now look, there's lots of other risk factors. Can the bank look at how much do I earn? Have I been in bankruptcy before? Have I been a credit risk and other things? Absolutely. But just like we do with race, we say this is one of those factors that is off the table for you to consider. We don't let you target citizens because you don't like what they say or what they believe. Because we know that these banks are dominated by those on the left, by right? the woke agenda that has adopted this wholesale. And they're using those same factors, using things like the SPLC's hate list as a determination of whether you can make, of whether you can get access to this. And the second thing it does, it gives transparency. Because these organizations, people like Indigenous and Fans or Sam Brownback's organization, they should have to go to the national news media and get reporters to start hassling these banks just to get an explanation. Tell me why. If it was for a legitimate reason, if I missed a payment, if I did something wrong, that's fine. But if you're doing it because of an invidious reason, if you're doing it because of one of these protected reasons, my speech or my religion, fess up and take responsibility for it. We want to put consumers in the driver's seat of making sure that they are not shut down from access to these essential things. So I'm really excited about this. Again, it's one of those areas, when I first heard about it, it's like the banking, this, this seems like something. But we talk about the growing threats of freedom. We've worked for years, the light's been defending freedom, being standing against government overreach into our constitutionally protected freedoms. But what we're seeing now, it's a handful of these mega banks that control so much of our economy that are welding power that in some ways is even stronger than that of the federal government. Right now, the federal government can't stop me from buying gas or getting a plane ticket, but MasterCard sure can. They can't deny me from being able to pay for my kid's soccer practice or make a donation to my church. But J.P. Morgan shakes, Bank of America. Okay. And that's why we have to stand and say, look, you big banks, you get all these benefits. You're too big to fail, right? You get these bailouts, you get these favorite insurance rates. If you're too big to fail, you're too big to have bias against Americans. It's because of their beliefs and values. So I'm really excited about this. We'd love to share more with you. We've got great resources that we've put together, sharing some of these stories, answering questions that we often hear pop up. Oh, is this anti-free market? Not at all, because who's the free market for? It's for you, it's for the consumers. It's to make sure that you have access to what you need to support you and your family. So again, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, Becky, for inviting me and love working with you all, looking forward. And real quick, I did want to introduce two of my colleagues that are here, um, Sarah Beth Nolan, and Matthew Nico, Sarah Beth is one of our your brilliant attorneys. Matthew Nico, many of you know, helps with government relations here in Alabama. And we're honored to partner with Eagle Forum and serve you all any way we can. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.